So she said I was going to give you more information about Good Friday. I, I don't have much more information for you. <laughs> so <clears throat> we do know it's going to be on Good Friday. We do know that we're going to be partnering again with Hope Church and Ambassadors Church, which is really cool. Uh, for those of you guys who were with us on the Christmas Eve service, we went to Riverfront Park and we had this uh, really beautiful and excellent service out there. So we might be doing that again. So the, the Good Friday service might be at Riverfront again. It might also be behind Push Ridge. We don't know. That's what happens when pastors plan things is it doesn't go very good. So I'm, I'm, I do promise I'm going to meet with Randy and Dave this week and we're going to hammer out all the details and give you guys the exact specifications next Sunday. Uh, you can hold me to that. But right now, that's, that's really all we know. We think it's around 630. We think that it's going to be in that general area and we know it's going to be on Good Friday. Beyond that, I'm sorry. That's that's my bad. So I told Ashley not to announce it, so it's on me. So you know that it's my fault, and you can hold me accountable to that. All right. Uh, the other announcement that I have is the book club. I announced it last week. I uh, I said it's going to be mid-April, and I also said that uh, we're the first book we're going to do is The Great Divorce. So anyone who wants to be a part of the book club, uh, come up after. I was going to do like a mass text, but then I realized I hate mass text. So I'm just going to talk to you in person. We're going to, I'm going to tell you the day, I'm going to tell you the time, and we're going to do it. So even if you don't actually want to read the books, but you just want to be there, I'm not going to give you a quiz or anything, and you just want to know more about these really excellent works that exist in the world, uh, feel free to come, and it's going to be a really good time. But with all that preface being done, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can go to Luke chapter 11. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, we're going to project all the verses up on the screen. Um but we have been going through the book of Genesis. That, that is, bless you, uh, that is where we've been at for since we started the church. I took a little bit of a detour, though. And the reason why is because we got to Genesis 4, and it utilized the phrase of the line of Seth began to call upon the name of God. And there is a simple way of understanding that, which is that they began to know God personally. But then there's a more complex way of understanding that, and that is that they began to commune with God through what we call prayer. So I thought it would be a really cool idea to use the, the three weeks leading up to Easter to talk about prayer, because sometimes we need the, the 101 class, right? Even though we've been a Christian for a while, we may forget some of the basics, or maybe we never even learned the basics. And it's good to uh, revitalize ourselves, to go back to the beginning. So Luke 11, verse 1 starts like this. Now it came to pass... As he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. As we spoke last week, this is prefaced, right? This, this teaching of what we call the Lord's Prayer is prefaced by his disciples asking him how to pray, right? And these are men who have been Jews their entire lives, men who have learned how to pray from a very young age, but they're recognizing in Jesus there's a level of intimacy, there's a level of depth that existed in his prayer life that they wanted to learn. And what Jesus is giving them here right now is not just a formula. He's not saying if you say these exact words, it opens the heavens and you receive blessing. What he's saying is this is a template. This is a, a method by which you could approach God. This is a, a form in which you can pray to God and experience deeper awe and intimacy with him. And there are four elements of prayer that are denoted here. There is adoration, confession, um, there's thanksgiving, and there's supplication. Last week, we talked about adoration, and we also talked about address. So we went through our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This week, we're going to be talking about supplication and thanksgiving. And that is summed up in, this, in these lines. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread. Most people, when they think about prayer, this is what they think about. They think about asking some divine power for assistance or miraculous power or something like that. That is usually how we conceptualize a prayer. Last week we talked about that's actually not the intent of prayer. That's not the purpose of prayer. 
but it is a facet of prayer. The purpose of prayer is having a time or having an ability to draw near to God and to experience intimacy with him. That's, that's really why God has given his people the ability to pray. However, part of that intimacy is the ability to ask God for our daily bread, our ability to actually, the, the fancy word is to supplicate him, to ask him for things. And that's what we're going to be learning about today, because this is one that's gone really sideways, especially in the last couple of decades in the American church. So we're going to try to hopefully understand what is actually being communicated here and balance things out, because there are two really bad but equally wrong ways to approach this form of prayer. The first one is to approach it from more of like a prosperity perspective, which is that through praying, through the activity of prayer, I move the will of God and therefore can get from him a blessed life. That's one wrong way to look at it. The other wrong way to look at it is the will of God is fixed. And so therefore asking God for things is really, it doesn't do anything. It's more of like a show. You, you kind of do it, but it doesn't have any actual efficacy. So we're going to go through the Bible and we're going to try to figure out exactly what Jesus is communicating. But off the bat, from that formula, you could probably see that the prosperity method is missing a couple ideas, right? So the prosperity method is, again, that I can move heaven. And yet Jesus prefaces the asking for our daily bread by saying, your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So right off the bat, we could see that this is obviously not about moving the will of God but it is about conforming our hearts to what the will of God is. So why is it that there is such a, a huge and growing population of Christians who believe in what's called prosperity, especially in the West today? Well, the reason why is, is not because they're actually going outside the Bible. It's because there are texts in the Bible that seem to suggest that. So I'll give you one. John 14, verse 13, Jesus speaking to his apostles. He says this, and whatever you ask in my name, that is. I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And that's not an isolated verse. There are many, many verses like that. If you go through the Psalms, in fact, David prays to God that he would answer his prayers according, this is quote, according to his righteousness. And that seems to suggest the modern conception of prayer, that the holier you are, the more aligned with God you are, the more likely he is to answer your prayers. I remember when I was in the Marines, I wasn't that great of a guy in the Marines. I'm still not that great of a guy, but I was a worse guy when I was in the Marines. And, but like the, the one thing I didn't do is I didn't get drunk. And my friends thought I was like the holiest guy because of that. And when we were going in Afghanistan, they would ask me all the time, like, can you pray for us? Like, it was like this idea, like you're a holy God will listen to you. We're not going to pray. There's this idea that like the holier you, uh, the holier you are, or the more in line with God you are, the more likely he is to listen to your prayer, to, the more likely he is to answer your prayer. And even in other facets of Christianity, this idea exists. This is where the concept of praying to saints comes from, from the Roman Catholic Church, that obviously God would be more likely to listen to a saint than he would be to you. And this is, again, where the modern-day prosperity movement comes from, that if you're living a holy and righteous life, God would answer your prayers, that he would do for you what you want. And so if you're not receiving a prosperous life, it must be because you're either lacking holiness or you're not asking God vigorously enough for what you really want. Uh, one of the most extreme examples of this, which I find very interesting, you could read this on your own time if you want, but in 2 Kings chapter 20, a king of Israel, a guy named Hezekiah, is actually struck with an illness that Isaiah tells him, will kill him. He says, this, this illness is not going to be healed. You're going to die. And Hezekiah intercedes powerfully before the Lord. And God actually sends Isaiah back and says, hey, I'm going to give you time. Right? You're not going to die right now. I'm going to give you time. So all of these examples, all these biblical examples have spoken to people. And they're like, clearly in the Bible, it does teach that we can move the will of God. That if we're holy, if we're righteous, if our hearts are in the right place and we're praying to God in a sincere manner, God's will can change and orient itself towards our will. 
And so people in the prosperity movement, they pray expectantly for the movement of God and the movement of his will because they believe that they could actually do it. Now, I'm not picking on this guy, um, Joel Osteen. I'm not picking on him, but I am going to quote him because I do believe he's, he's probably one of the more popular prosperity teachers today. And he's also one of the less, uh, I was going to use the word crazy, but that's me, uh, the, the less uh, emphatic, the, the less passionate, the less um, on, on the spectrum of, uh, you'd say, like word of faith, prosperity. He's, he's a little bit more in the middle, right? He's definitely not as far as guys like Kenneth Copeland uh, or people like that. But in a recent post that he put on his website, uh, he has a, it's called Energize Your Life. <clears throat> and he says this, are you taking time to declare God's goodness over your life? Are you speaking victory over your future? It's not enough to do it every once in a while. It needs to become a habit where all through the day, you're declaring that you're blessed, you're strong, you're healthy. When you wake up in the morning, say, Lord, thank you that something good is going to happen to me today. Thank you that favor is surrounding me. Blessings are chasing me down and that your being for me is more than the world being against me. That's setting your life in the right direction. So notice his conception of prayer is again, it's not seeking God's will for your life. It's actually, and he doesn't even use the word pray. He uses the word declare. It's about declaring a prosperous life for yourself with expectation that God's will is going to move in accordance with your faith. This is also why they sometimes call this movement the word of faith movement. They believe that positive affirmations produce positive results. Now, this is not just sequestered to that form of Christianity either. This is, I would say, the prevailing ideology in America today. Uh, now, it was popularized, I think, mostly, ironically, by Oprah, right? But the idea is that it's an Eastern idea that mixes modern, I guess you'd call modern prosperity with Eastern karma. And so the, the two big books that came out after all this uh, started to, to go, uh, the first one's called The Law of Attraction. You may have heard of that one, as well as The Universe Has Got Your Back. And the idea is that, once again, you have a good moral system, right? You do the right thing. You visualize your future. You usually put it up on what's called a vision board. And then by speaking those things over your life, eventually they begin to manifest within your day-to-day -day life. So you may hear people even use that language sometimes. I'm going to manifest good things, right? That's the modern conception. It's, it's a very, very powerful conception that earth can move heaven to produce blessing and prosperity for my needs. Okay. Now what's the other side? The other side is, is more of a fatalistic. And fatalism is, you can kind of hear it in the, in, the, in the word, fatalism is you are just subjected to fate. You actually have no free will. You have no autonomy. The will of God is the will of God. Um, so in Psalm 115, verse 2 through 3, it says this, Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. Now, if you read the entire psalm, it's really fascinating. The psalmist is contrasting God, Yahweh, with the pagan deities. And he's insulting the pagan deities. And he's saying that one of the reasons why our God is superior to theirs is that their gods have malleable wills that men can move. And he says, our God is superior because he sits in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. He is not moved by your will. He is only moved by his own will. And so people who really subscribe to this conception of prayer, they have a very, like I said, a fatalistic approach to their prayer life. They say like, well, you know, it's really not my place to ask God for this or that. They have no expectancy of God listening to what they're saying. And they instead have a view of just stoic acceptance. God has a will for your life. It's going to happen no matter what. And you could either go willingly or you could go kicking and screaming, but it's going to happen. And you just need to deal with it. And they honestly conceptualize of holiness of people who just take life as it is. And they don't complain. They think of saints as being people who just, you know, whatever bad things happen in their life, they're like, hey, you know, Lord gives, Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. They don't shed a tear. They don't get sad. Nothing at all disturbs them. They just stoically accept all of the issues of life. And they see that as holiness. 
So if you have this idea, your prayer life will probably be pretty dead because why ask God for anything? And for a long time in my life, that's how I approach God. Where I'm like, you know what? Why am I praying anything? Isn't God sovereign? Isn't God going to do whatever he wants to do? Why am I asking him for anything? And so I stopped asking him for anything and uh, my prayer life kind of dried up. So what's the balance? Okay, I'm going to give you a really fancy term that you could throw around if you want. Molinism is an interesting kind of theological term, but it just comes from a guy named Molina. That's what it's come from, if you, if you want to know that. Molinism is the best way that I've found to balance these two ideas, to harmonize the biblical scriptures that seem to say both things. And a passage that represents what I think is the, the Molinist idea is 1 John 5, verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. What's the balance that this passage is providing for us? It's saying that if I pray anything, if I ask anything that is in accordance with God's will, it will be answered. It will be done. That may sound like a really, really dumb promise. You're like, so you're saying if I pray what God already wants, then it will happen? That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that your prayers, this is weird to say, our prayers have efficacy as long as they line up with God's will. Or to put it a, a different way, <clears throat> is to suggest this. God is so sovereign. He is so above and beyond the universe that he actually takes the free will of man into account in accordance with his divine eternal will. He knew exactly what you were going to pray. He knew exactly when you were going to pray it. And he actually acts in response to what you asked. He actually does it. And he's doing it because he wants you to know that he hears you. He actually listens to you. But God already knew that you were going to pray that thing at that exact time and already had intended to act. So the thing that bakes our noodle a little bit is, well, if God, would have God have acted if I never prayed that way? Well, God already knew you were going to pray that way, right? It's like that weird scene from The Matrix where he knocks over the bitch. He's like, hey, don't worry about the vase. And he knocks it over. And she's like, ah, what's really going to bake your noodle later is, would you have still broken it if I didn't say anything, right? That's what really blows our brains. If I didn't pray it, would God have still have done it? Well, there's no reality in which you wouldn't have prayed it. So God would have already done it. Don't even think about it. It was just, it'll just mess you up. But that's the idea. You and I have the great and amazing, glorious, uh, I guess you'd call it privilege, to participate with God's divine will by praying in accordance with his will. So when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're really praying is God align my will with yours so that my prayers actually are answered because they are prayed in accordance with your will. Now, if you really stopped and thought about it, I think only a really, really foolish person would want there to be prayers that move heaven. Think about this for a second. Imagine, you know, if an angel came to you tonight and he said to you, every prayer that you prayed 20 years ago, I will answer. God is going to answer emphatically right now. Now, those of you guys who aren't even 20 years old yet, but okay, but take it back 10 years, right? Half your age or something like that. And just say, all the wants and desires that you had 10 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago even, would you want those right now? And most of us who are thinking, we would say, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I thank God that he said no to all the various desires that I had 20 years ago because I didn't know any better, but God did. God says no, not because he hates you, not because he doesn't like you, not because he's not listening to you. He says no because he's our father in heaven. He has a different perspective than you. He will only move in accordance with his, his will. He will not allow you. Praise God, he doesn't allow me this. And I had this like really complex. But you know what? You're right, Peter. Let me give you this thing, this thing that you think is so cool. Let me give it to you right now. It would ruin your life. Right? So it gives you amazing comfort to know that. But it also gives you a submissive enough to allow your will to be transformed, to be in accordance with his divine will. 
which gives us another understanding of this prayer for God's kingdom to come. <laughs> so this is a prayer for the future, right? It's a prayer for God's kingdom to come. It is a prayer for God to come back, right? For Jesus to return as he has promised that he will and right this world. But there's a immediate answer to this prayer as well, because the kingdom of heaven is a little bit different than most people think. So this is Luke 17, verse 20 through 21. Jesus says this, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So when you're reading the New Testament and you hear Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, and you're like, what is that? What he's saying is that God is already enthroned in heaven. He is already sovereign over all things. And the difference in this world is not there are places in the world where God is sovereign and there are places in the world where God is not sovereign. No, no, no. The only difference in this world is there are places in this world in which God's sovereignty is recognized and there are places where it is not. And that really happens in the heart of the individual. We become an outpost of God's heavenly kingdom when we accept him as our king. So for the Christian, when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we've actually grown the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is not limited to a nation. It's not limited to an edifice. It's not limited even to an institution. The kingdom of heaven exists in reality, but it exists exists in heavenly reality. And when we accept that as our reality, when we come before God and we say, not as I will, but as you will, you've grown the kingdom of heaven. The boundaries of the kingdom of heaven have grown in your heart. And so when we're praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're saying. God, enlarge your kingdom. Enlarge your kingdom in my heart. Change my will. Change my desires to be fixated upon you and you alone. That people will see the majesty and the beauty of your plan and your will as I submit to it in all sincerity. That's what grows the kingdom of heaven. And that's why it's so valuable for us to pray that way. So the next part of the prayer is give us day by day our daily bread. What does that mean? That again should give us a clue of what it means to supplicate God, to ask him for things. I'm going to break this into two categories. The first one is praying for blessing, right? Praying for physical blessing. And the second one is praying for wisdom, which is again, another thing that we really want from God. We want him to tell us what to do. When we're praying for blessing though, and we're praying, we're praying, sorry, my my words are not great right now. Uh, when we're praying, give us day by day our daily bread. What we're saying to God is, I have needs, but I don't know what they are. Just as my body has a need for bread, my soul has needs today. And I have no clue what those needs might be. The person in the Bible who summed up this concept the best is a guy named King Agur. And he wrote chapter 30 of the book of Proverbs. And in it, he says this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. So when he's coming before the Lord and he's saying, give me day by day my daily bread, what he's saying is, I don't know what the needs of my life are. I don't know. I may want to be rich, but maybe being rich would be bad for me in the long run. Or sometimes maybe you have an ascetic mindset and maybe you want to be poor, but maybe being poor would be bad for you. You don't know what your needs are. So when you're coming before God and you're saying, give me day by day my daily bread, what you're saying is, I'm going to give you my desires. I'm going to pray sincerely what I want. You're supposed to do that. But I'm also going to accept that my wants might not be my needs. And so I'm entrusting you, Lord, to show me what the difference is. We have an ultimate example of this in Jesus himself. 
In Matthew 26, verse 38 through 39, Jesus is facing the cross. He's about to go through his crucifixion. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, and he says this, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And then he went a little further and fell on his face, and he prayed, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see the balance? Jesus is not some stoic. He's not going to the cross and he's like, oh, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I'm just going to go to the cross and that's cool. You know, and he's like smiling and he's totally all right. It says, he said, I'm exceedingly sorrowful to death. He experienced intense, passionate emotion. He goes before God. If you keep reading the account, he is so agonized by what he's praying here. He begins to sweat blood. Jesus did not go passively to the cross. He did not go stoically to the cross without shedding a tear or without any anxiety. Jesus was gripped with what he was going through. He felt it to his core. He felt it so intensely that he began to bleed even before a single wound was dealt to him. But when he comes before God, notice the beautiful balance of the prayer. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He's praying his desire. He's saying, Lord, this is what I want. I don't want to die. If there's any other way that you could save humanity, please allow this cup to pass for me, God. But he's also accepting the ultimate will of God. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Remember that Jesus knew what the will of the Father was. He did know that he was supposed to go to the cross. And yet he still passionately prays this prayer. Now, <clears throat> think about this for a second. How many of us would have the faith in God necessary to pray, not as I will, but as you will, if you knew for a fact that God's will was for you to die a painful death? That's the kind of faith that Jesus demonstrated in the garden. He didn't go before God saying like, Lord, I need this and I know what I need. And this is really painful and I don't want to do it. He came before God and he knew the Father's will is for me to die. God, so if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's the kind of faith that God wants to produce in us when we pray for his kingdom come and for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, there are other benefits to praying in this way. I think John Calvin sums them up pretty good in his book, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. He says this, It is very much for our interest to be constantly supplicating him. First, that our heart may always be inflamed with a serious, serious and ardent desire of seeking, loving, and serving him, while we accustom ourselves to have recourse to him as a sacred anchor in every necessity. Secondly, that no desire, no longing whatever, of which we are ashamed to make him the witness, may enter our minds. While we learn to place all our wishes in his sight, and thus pour out our hearts before him. And lastly, that we may be prepared to receive all his benefits with true gratitude and thanksgiving. While our prayers remind us that they proceed from his hand, moreover, having obtained what we have asked, being persuaded that he has answered our prayers, we are led to long more earnestly for his favor and at the same time have greater pleasure in welcoming the blessings which we perceive to have been obtained through our prayers. So he lays out three benefits towards praying constantly for God to satisfy our wants. Three benefits that we get from this. Number one, it honors God and increases our desire for him. If this part of your prayer life is lacking, it's very hard to grow your passion for the Lord. Because when we come before God and we're talking to him about our most earnest desires, that's building intimacy with God. If you notice in your day-to-day -day life with relationships, you have, you know, they're not articulated most of the time, but you do have boundaries between the way that you relate to people. There are levels of intimacy that you feel comfortable with and there are levels of intimacy that you don't feel comfortable with when you're talking to people, right? And I think the easiest way to conceptualize this is your house, right? So in your home, you have levels of comfort 
that you have with people when they come by, right? To total strangers, the sidewalk is probably the boundary, right? You know, that's, I feel comfortable with you on the sidewalk. You get close to my front porch, probably not. Maybe my door, you know, if you have something important to ask me. But that's like the comfort level with strangers, right? If you know someone pretty well, you might be able to invite them into your living room uh, or maybe your backyard, right? If you're a little bit more comfortable with someone, you might be willing to let them into other areas of your house, right? You might be able to give them the, the tour, right? And, and show them all around, right? If you're really comfortable with someone, you might be allowing them into your fridge, right? You know, those are kind of like levels of intimacy that you're developing with people as you go closer. Your heart kind of works the same way, right? There are levels of intimacy that you're willing to give people within your soul. So when someone asks you like, hey, how are you doing? Right? To a total stranger, you're not going to give them anything. You're going to be like, oh, I'm doing great. You know, like you're, you're not, even if you're doing terrible, you're going to say I'm doing great because you don't feel comfortable enough with that level of intimacy. But the closer you get to someone, you should be letting them into more and more of what's going on. So they ask that question, you might give them, give them a more sincere answer. Oh, I'm doing bad or I'm doing like really great. This is what's going on in my life, right? You start telling them about what's happening in your life and how it's impacting you. Not only is that a sign of intimacy, but it's also a seal of intimacy. It grows your intimacy. So parents, you may notice that with your kids. As your kids start to drift away, usually around the teenage years, your answer, the answer to the question of how is your day becomes more vague. And you can feel it, right? When they're a kid, they'll tell you everything, right? My daughter will tell me everything. She'll tell you everything too. She just doesn't have a filter. She doesn't know about this, this intimacy thing that I'm talking to you about. Uh, but, you know, she'll just open up and tell you everything that's going on in her life because she's, she's free. She's open like that. But as they become teenagers and you ask, well, how was your day? Good. What'd you learn? Nothing. You know, like they, 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 their answers become just like monosyllabic, you know, like they, they don't really get intimate with you because they're not intimate with you. They're growing distant from you. And you feel it. Our relationship with God works exactly the same way. If you're not willing to tell God, even though he already knows, if you're not willing to communicate with God about your wants, your desires, the things that are going on in your life, what can you expect from a relationship with him but shallowness? So John Calvin is saying, we got to go to God. we got to tell him our, our desires because by communicating our desires, we develop intimacy. Second, by bringing our desires to God, he can change them and show us the wisdom of our folly through that. <clears throat> Oftentimes, when a desire stays in your head, you can be blind to how foolish that desire really is. And when you say it out loud, you become very self-aware. So when you come before God, some, simply, sometimes simply saying out loud what you want can reveal something. So you say, God, I really want you to do this. And then the second you say it out loud, you're like, oh, that was kind of dumb. I take that back, right? So even in the moment, you can sometimes see it. But as you pray things, because the Bible tells us to keep praying for things. So just because you pray for it once doesn't mean you stop praying. Until you get a definitive answer from God, you should keep praying for your wants. And as you pray it, you might be willing, be open to God changing your mind to God showing you in your life that maybe the things that you want are not the things you need and to learn to let them go. Third, it produces a heart in us of thanksgiving. Now, being thankful is a very difficult thing to do. When you're asking God for things, it is a reminder to you that every good and perfect gift comes from your Father in heaven. When you don't pray for the things that you want, you can begin to believe that you are actually accomplishing all the things that you have. Um, I, I love reading through Psalm 103, <clears throat> which is a psalm that says, uh, Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. And in it, he gives reasons to be thankful for God's blessing. And one of the reasons that he gives is he heals all of my diseases. Now, I've, I've read the entire biography of David that's given to us in the Bible. He is never supernaturally healed from any illness. Not once. So what is he saying in Psalm 103? He's not saying God has supernaturally healed me from things. What he's saying is that God has made me, as he puts it in Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully. He's given me a body that actually fights off illness. 
Isn't that amazing? And he's thankful for it. How often are we thankful for being healed from a basic sickness? Probably hearing my voice and I've been praying a lot for that right now in my own life. But a basic illness, right? God has given you an incredible life filled with blessings. And we take them for granted. We take for granted the fact that we're healthy. We take for granted the fact that we just go outside and see immense beauty in his creation. We take so many things for granted because we don't pause and recognize them and learn to be thankful for them. You know, the one time in your life where you start to become thankful for what you have is when you start to lose something, even something basic. I remember as a, as a teenager, you know, I got into a bad skiing accident and it kind of jacked up my back and it's still kind of jacked up, but it, it's gotten better. I remember just thinking about like how nice it is, how nice it was just to be able to like get up without any pain, you know, <laughs> that's like a weird thing. But then when I, my back started to get healed, you become thankful for little things like that. You're like, wow, I could like get up and it didn't hurt. That was pretty nice. You know, like I could, if you have something wrong with your eyes, you go outside, you're like, wow, I can see stuff. This is kind of cool. The basic blessings that you take for granted become special to you when you start losing them. But God doesn't want us to have to get there. He wants us to just be thankful for things so that we are giving God not just a little bit of our desires, but all of our desires. That we come before him in prayer and we honestly confess to him the things that we most ardently want so that we can become thankful for the things that we have. People who do not supplicate God often tend not to be very thankful for the things that they have within their life. Next Asking for wisdom. Now, this is another one that uh, gets a little bit convoluted. We ask God for wisdom. Now, what we really mean by asking God for wisdom, and I'm going to kind of differentiate this in a second here, is we actually want God to give us guidance. So this is James 1, bless you, 1, verse 5 through 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So we read that passage, we're like, yeah, I could go to God and I can ask him for guidance. I have big decisions coming up in my life and I can say, God, you know, like what's going on here? Because the vast majority of needs that you and I have on a regular basis are not for physical blessings, but they're for wisdom because we are always facing challenges and difficulties of which we don't know what to do. And we know making the wrong decision will have really cataclysmic effects. And by the way, the knowledge of that is grown in our modern day. So back in the day when you couldn't really compare yourself to many people very often, you weren't really very self-conscious of the decisions that you made, especially since the vast majority of your decisions were just made for you back in the day. You know, I, I always use the example of blue jeans. You know, you, you go to the store, you go to the Levi section or whatever, and there's like 50 million jeans there. And it's so overwhelming, you don't know what to pick, and you end up going home with nothing. But back in the day, you would go to the store, and there was one color, there was one type, and it's small, medium, and large. And either you fit one of those sizes, or you put a big belt on, and you dealt with it, right? There's kind of a niceness to that. But when you have so many choices open to you all the time, it's a little paralyzing. You don't know if you're going to make the wrong decision and totally screw up your life. It's one of the reasons why young kids are so paralyzed by decision making. It's not because that sometimes older people are like, why are you complaining about it? Look at all the stuff that's open to you. That's why they're paralyzed. It's because of all the stuff that's open to them. They really do have the world at their fingertips and, you know, both in some ways, literally. And so, yeah, decisions are really, really crippling for them. And this idea that they can come before God and get direct answers to what they want is really amazing. But I want to point something out. James does not promise guidance. He promises wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom isn't doing the right thing. Wisdom is knowing what the right thing is. That's what wisdom is. So I, I was thinking about examples for this and I was like, yes, I thought of a great example that deals with Back to the Future Part 2 which is like one of my favorite movies. So in Back to the Future Part 2, if you haven't seen it, it's classic. you got to go watch it. Watch Part 1 first. But in Part 2, there's a time machine, and Biff Tannen, who's like the bully throughout the entire series, and he's kind of an idiot, he ends up going back in time and giving himself a sports almanac that allows for him to make all these right bets and become a multimillionaire. Right? Now, as the audience, though, everyone around him thinks like, this dude's a genius. 
this guy's so shrewd. He's so wise. Look at all the right decisions he's making. He's built an empire. He is so smart. But as the audience, you know, this guy's an idiot. He's a total dull, but he just has been given special knowledge that allows for him to make wise decisions, although he is not wise. See the difference? If God answered every question you had and gave you guidance, you might be making all the right decisions, but you're not wise. You're still a fool. Same with like parenting. As a, as a parent, if you make all the decisions for your kid, hey, there's an age where you got to do that. But there's an age where you got to start backing off as a parent because you understand something as a parent. I don't want my kid to just make all the right decisions. I want them to be wise. I want them to be able to make decisions for themselves. So if a, a little five-year-old comes up to their parent and they say, hey, like, what, what can I eat tonight? That's good. If a 35-year-old calls their parent on the phone and says, hey, mom, what should I eat tonight? Something has gone very, very wrong in that parenting relationship. God doesn't want you to just make the right decisions. He wants you to become wise because wisdom is a type of virtue in the Bible. That's why we have an entire book devoted to it. Right? God wants you to be able to know what the right decision is. And so therefore, oftentimes, God will not directly guide his people. Even people that have really critical roles in the Bible are sometimes not led at all directly by God. My favorite example of this is the book of Esther. Esther was used by God to literally save the people of Israel. You know how many times God directly leads her? Never. His name doesn't even show up in the book. The closest you get to divine guidance is her uncle Mordecai comes to her and he says, how do you know that you weren't raised into the kingdom for such a time as this? That's as close as you get. He's like, look, it, it, from my earthly perspective, it looks like this is the best decision for you to make. But I don't know. I don't know. We want certainty, but God oftentimes is not going to give you certainty. The only way to grow in wisdom is to make decisions and to learn from the consequences. So God will very often not guide you, not directly. Now, we don't understand this. We tend to turn other things into the voice of God. We tend to look for vague symbols, right? We're like, oh, it's a sign. You know, this happened. You know, I, I told God that if I, if I was, if something was going to happen to me, I would see an owl and I saw like 10 owls today. So clearly it's really, you, you can look for weird, vague signs if you want, but oftentimes you're just listening to the dictates of your own soul at that point. A great example of this and a sad example of this is a guy named George Whitfield. Now, um, this story is kind of laid out in a, in a book by Timothy Keller uh, called Prayer, Experiencing on Intimacy with God, but I'm going to sum it up for you. So George Whitfield was probably one of the best orators in all of church history, and he was used powerfully by God as one of the architects of what we call the First Great Awakening. He's an amazing, amazing man of God. Now, him and his wife got pregnant, and they were going to have a son. And he believed that God was telling him that this son was going to have a ministry like John the Baptist. And he actually named his son John, dedicated him from the church, and had a long sermon about how his son was going to have this major prolific ministry that was going to span continents. The problem is that little John died about two months later. Now, that's a tragic instance, but he had to go and apologize to his congregation later. And he says, I took what was supposed to be simply a tragedy. And I turned it into an occasion for people to doubt the very word of God. So he soberly understood something. He understood, I took my natural desires as a parent to see my child succeed. And I turned it into the voice of God. It's very easy to do that. It's very easy to feel because you want something so bad that God is telling you something. But he might not be. It might just be the dictates of your heart. This is not to say that God can't speak to you directly, that he can't guide you directly. He can, and he does. It's only saying that you can never be totally sure unless there's some sort of a miraculous sign accompanying it. Okay, so yeah, if a miracle accompanies God guiding you, you could take that pretty good. But if no miracle occurs, it doesn't mean that God hasn't spoken. But hold what you think God is saying with loose hands and test it. Test it because it might not be God. 
and you might be trying to do something with all of your might that God doesn't even want for you. So we need to be very, very careful about that. <clears throat> so we're going to end this time by having a time of communion. And while we're having communion, I want us to meditate on something very specific. So in all this prayer of asking for God's kingdom to come and asking for our daily bread, we need to remember that Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 35 said this, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. When we're asking God for our daily bread, for the desires of our life, we need to remember that just as my body has desires and needs, my soul has needs. And those needs are met only in the person of Jesus Christ. All the desires that you have in your life, as beautiful and as good as they are, they point to your ultimate desire and need in God. So as we spend time in, in communion, once again, there's a reason why we eat bread. There's a reason why we drink wine. We're remembering that as my body needs its daily bread, my soul needs daily communion with God. And we do that in prayer, and we also do that in a physical way, that we get to manifest that faith in a very, very precious act that we call communion. So as, as I always say, this is available for all those who have a relationship with God, those who have come to him on the basis of him being their Lord and Savior. These elements are open for you. If you haven't made that decision, if you have not made Jesus your Lord and Savior, I ask that you let the elements go by. If you want to know more about what it means to have a personal relationship with God, you can approach one of the elders after the service. But for now, let's pray, and we'll take communion together. Father, we love you. We're grateful for you. I thank you that you have given your son as a propitiation for our souls, for a forgiveness for the many sins that we have committed before you. I thank you, God, that we can come before you and ask you day by day for our daily bread. And that we know that we can participate with your divine will through our prayer life. What an amazing gift that you've given to us. But God, I pray that we hold our desires and all the blessings that we ask you for with open hands and that we would be people who truly seek your will above our own. In your name, amen.